Morning, everyone. Uh, Sarah Seguin, I am with Alloy, which is a global identity decisioning platform. Uh, I'm a principal advisor for them on fraud and identity risk, but prior to Alloy, I was with KeyBank and I led enterprise fraud strategy. Hi, everyone. I'm Naftali Harris, co founder and CEO of Centilink. Centilink stops fraud for banks, lenders, and other financial institutions. Uh, we serve over 300 in the United States, including seven of the top 15 banks. And every day we process over a million identity verifications. Uh, we got our start by solving synthetic fraud. We now do a lot of other things as well, including ID theft and first party fraud. But we're the first company to commercialize a synthetic fraud solution. Steve Wonderman, uh, Senior Vice President at BM Technologies. Um, prior to BM Technologies, spent time at PayPal, ADP, and pick a, pick a credit card bank in Wilmington, Delaware, because I worked for them all. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Alona Katz. Um, I've been a prosecutor for over a decade now. Um, I currently serve as the Deputy Bureau Chief of the Cybercrime and Identity Theft Bureau at the Manhattan DA's office. And I always just have to say my views are my own, not necessarily those of the office. Ditto. <laughs> Great. I speak for the company. Uh, <laughs> as you can. <laughs> Um, so um, let's start with uh, knowing where we're going often helps knowing where we've been. So let's start with a little bit of history. Um, Sarah, maybe you can share kind of what you've seen historically of how synthetic um, identity has grown and evolved. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I think it, it may be to no surprise for anyone here if we look back the pandemic, you know, a lot with government programs and what we started to see was folks saw the ease of committing fraud and how they could start to combine identities, whether it is blended or manipulate identities, um, and even manufacture some of those identities. And so I think from an ease perspective, it started to expose gaps um, for many institutions. And so fast forward from even an Alloy perspective, Alloy conducted a survey at the end of 2022 for what was top of mind for financial institutions, ranging from fintechs to uh, enterprise banks. And what's top of mind is the overwhelming response was synthetic fraud. So I think it really shows what everyone is focused on, the concern there, and that it, it's a real industry issue. Yeah. Steve? I know you've got a lot of history, not to age you. But. <laughs> I think this, this ages me just fine. Uh, but yeah, uh, just as, as mentioned, right, so synthetic fraud is not new. Like, actually, the very first case was prosecuted here in Man Manhattan in 2007. Uh, I've been working and playing in the synthetic space since the early 2000s, to put it nicely. Um, I managed three synthetic identities, one of which is, uh, is now a 44-year-old individual with a 17-year-old child who's also th synthetic. Um, so and getting ready to attend a virtual college in the very near future, so that'll be fun. Um, so I started, the, I started playing in the synthetic space because I was in the credit card space, which is where synthetics kind of really bubbled up and, and, and became a real problem. Um, and so, we'll, you know, like anything in a fraud space, you want to learn about how the bad guys are doing it, you've got to do it yourself. And so I just started playing in that space and uh, kind of found out how easy it was to do. Um, I continue to manage those synthetics. I use them, obviously, to, to test strategies, but I also use them for basically operational security when I'm doing OSINT tech, you know, research, et cetera. So um, they're, they're kind of fun. They're interesting now. They're, they have really taken on a life of their own. Uh, every day I have to manage these synthetics and, and do what we all do as humans and interact like a, like a real person does. So it, it is a little bit of work. I only have three of them. And Natalia will tell you about the scale that we're seeing synthetics coming through. Um, because I'm the guy in the hoodie in the basement doing synthetics. And that's not what's happening now. Right? What's happening now is completely automated. It's inner, 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 uh, inner border. It's a, it's a mess, to put it nicely. <laughs> Um, Naftali, as a uh, tech founder right, and co-founder, what have you seen um, over the years of as technology evolved, how fraudsters have manipulated that technology to their benefit? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think as different kinds of solutions have come in place and um, as uh, different organizations have started to realize uh, what synthetic fraud is and how to stop it, it's evolved a little bit. I um, mean, actually, one thing that's interesting is I think the picture that a lot of us have in our minds about what a synthetic identity is um, isn't completely accurate. Um, there's actually two important subtypes of synthetic fraud. 
Um, one is uh, what a lot of us would think about as a synthetic identity. So a completely fabricated uh, persona, a name, date of birth, and SSN. It doesn't belong to anyone. Um, you know, it's the Steve examples uh, where it's just these people don't exist at all. Um, but actually, that's the minority of synthetic identities. Um, about 80% of synthetic identities are what we at Centrelink call a first party synthetic identity. Uh, when a real person is manipulating aspects of their own identity, um, typically what this is is someone who uses their true name and date of birth, but a social that doesn't belong to them. Um, the idea being that if you have poor credit or something negative in your past that you'd like to hide, you can get a new social security number for yourself, start applying for credit again, and remove anything derogatory from your past. Um, that actually makes up 80% of synthetic identities. Um, it's the bulk of the synthetic fraud problem. Um, but of course, when people talk about quote unquote, you know, Frankenstein fraud or you know, a completely fabricated thing or what have you, um, they're mostly thinking about that third party version. Um, and I think over time, uh, to answer your question, as the fraudsters have gotten smarter about this and as institutions have gotten smarter themselves, um, a lot of that fraud has shifted to be um, to more first party in nature. Um, oftentimes, consumers don't even know that they're doing it. They're effectively fooled into doing this by uh, credit repair companies or the like. Great. Um, so let's talk a little bit. Uh, yesterday, um, some of you may have heard uh, my colleague Ranjita Iyer was up here um, talking about the emerging technologies, um, AI, uh, things that are going on to secure, right, and make quicker the digital payment ecosystem. So I'm curious from um, those technology standpoints. I know AI is a big one. We had. I, uh, the chat group was up here talking about it. Network. Everybody's like, "Is AI gonna? You know, is it is it for good? Is it for bad?" I'm really curious with these new emerging technologies. How, what is your opinion on how that could help or hinder synthetic identity fraud from a strategy's perspective? I think it'll do a lot, um, especially if you look at the new generative AI, which is where I think most of the advances have been. Um, I think it'll help fraudsters in some ways, but actually not in others. So um, it'll help them defeat uh, selfies and other kinds of biometric uh, related things, where today it's uh, you know relatively difficult to make up a real fake person and get that fake person a, a driver's license and stuff like that. Um, and I think uh, liveness checks that a lot of different um, doc verification companies have, you know, they can be relatively hard to defeat. But I think generative AI will make that a lot easier and same for voice uh, related things as well. Um, but actually, one thing that you know a lot of people don't realize is with a lot of the synthetic fraud that FIs are seeing today, most of it is very low tech. Um, you don't need generative AI to do it. I mean, you need to make up a fake name, date of birth, and SSN. It's very easy to make up an SSN. They're nine-digit numbers. All of you guys could go home or right now just type in a nine-digit number. It's probably a valid SSN. Um, and automating that as well is pretty easy. I mean, you, you only need you know a computer. Um, and so, I think generative AI will help us. Fraudsters with some things, uh, help them defeat liveness checks. It'll certainly help a lot in terms of committing scams, account takeover, um, social engineering, stuff like that. Uh, but in terms of uh, synthetic fraud that FIs have seen previously, I don't think it'll have much of an impact there. Steve, since you are three synthetic identities, want yeah, to talk so a little bit about how you homework, do that? <laughs> my homework for the Don't last... try this at home, folks. Yeah, yeah, these are research purposes only. There is uh, a prosecutor on the stage with us. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I'll leave Thank that you for here. what you do, by the way. Yes. I'll leave that one alone. Um, so yeah, so one of my projects I've been playing with these last probably uh, 12 months or so is is giving my synthetic identities a digital face and a digital voice, right? Because as uh, these mature, right, the, the banks and other institutions are starting to put in like liveliness checks, right? And so well, now it's easy for me. I just I just create a deep fake, right? And two years ago, creating a deep fake took quantum computing and took forever to do you can produce a deep fake now in less than two weeks, right? And so now I've created a face and a voice for my three synthetics, right? They're not really good yet because I'm not that smart, but the technology is there to, to do this, right? And so that's where I'm getting to the next point, the next evolution is as the banks continue to put these controls in, we all know the bad guys are one step ahead. So I'm trying to learn what, how to create these deep fakes and voices so that I can try to figure out what the banks can do to do that. And we see these, these uh, a lot of vendors talk about liveliness checks, et cetera. Um, and you know, we can beat most of that, right? It's being beat every day, all day. Um, so don't rely again on just that situation where you think, oh, it's a real person in front of you, because it may not be, and the person looking at that person may not actually be really trained in what they're looking at, right? That's the big problem too. So it, it's gonna be very interesting for us to use technology to take synthetics, to, I think, to the next level. But then again, for the banks to take AI, to counter that AI. <laughs> 
So besides the 44-year-old man with the 17-year-old kid going off to college, um, what are the other two, just so we can all be on the lookout for 44-year-old men with 17-year-old <laughs> yeah. virtual colleges? Yeah, that's the always question I get. Well, who <laughs> who are the me, other ones? Come your synthetics. And uh, so um, I created essentially three of those, and the most mature is the 44-year-old uh, male uh, with the child. Um, I have a another relative that I'm trying to build as an ant, because the old technology was this, is that what I thought was, you know, you can build synthetics relatively easy, and the first thing you would look for is, you know, do they have relatives? Because we all have relatives, whether you want them or not, you have them, right? But synthetics typically did, didn't have that, that was the initial catch. Look on Lexus, look on whatever it is, oh, there's no relatives, person just appeared out of nowhere, it's probably synthetic, right? So when you look at my synthetics now, I've built that infrastructure of, of relatives, I have deep credit files, uh, these synthetics play. I have Amazon accounts. I order pizza once a month to my commercial mail receiving agency so that I know data aggregators buy delivery addresses, they buy phone numbers, email addresses, they buy all that information. So for me, I just act like a real person. So that's the real fun part. And I will not give my, my information away, but <laughs> It, it's, it's fascinating, fun. fascinating. Um, Sarah, what are you um, thinking about from the emerging technologies and obviously listening to the sophistication, right, that uh, these uh, criminals are going through to create this type of fraud? Yeah, I, I mean, so when we think, I think there's a lot of institutions that don't even have maybe a synthetic model or behavioral technology running. And so I think it's an opportunity to take a step back and look at your tech stack and recognize what you have or what you don't have. Because the fact of the matter is they're not going away. Um, and so ensuring that you can be proactive in making those investments um, and understanding where the industry is going and where the fraud is going, I think is really important. Um, because as we talk about AI and everything that's that's emerging, uh, again, it, it's just going to keep increasing. And AI is what we have you know, on the horizon. There's going to be something else 10 years from now. So I think making sure that you can be proactive and, and put synthetic models um, and tools in place. Now, Alana, as the person that has to deal with all of this, um, what, what, what are things that you guys are thinking about from um, the technology standpoint and how that's helping or hindering how you guys are approaching finding and prosecuting this type of fraud? Yeah, first of, all, first of all, I just want to say, um, you know, Manhattan takes identity theft uh, cases very seriously, so much so that we have a dedicated unit. And by far, my best cases in prosecuting identity theft and involving synthetic identity is when there has been a public-private partnership. Um, there are a lot of financial institutions that are based in New York um, that know that we have a, a receptive bureau and dedicated prosecutors, and it makes all the difference in the world when in an investigator from a financial institution reaches out to me, you know, personally or our bureau and says, hey, I have this case, I built it up. I think all these identities aren't actually real and they've gone as far as to you know, put a chart together or have a graph and we have a meeting and they really helped me to understand because I will totally admit one of my first identity theft cases, I probably spent a couple of months investigating a man who, who didn't even exist. He was just a, you know, a hodgepodge of you know, credit applications and, and pizza orders. So it, it was a, a learning curve for me and I know it's definitely a learning curve um, for other prosecutors who don't necessarily enter the field of criminal prosecution thinking I'm going to pursue people who create who aren't real. <laughs> who aren't yeah. real. Um, so I truly, truly appreciate the collaboration of, of you know, in-house uh, risk teams and investigators. Um, I also love uh, a well-written SAR that really uh, summarizes what's going on and details the connections that an investigator has made behind the scene. Whenever I do events like this, people always say, but do you actually read our SARS? Do you actually read what I wrote? Um, I love them. I read them in great detail. When I request a backup document and it's actually really hardy and substantial, that goes such a long way to pursuing me, um, to, to motivating me to pursue a case instead of just getting an Excel that, you know, that summarized something that I can't um, make sense of. So for those of you who are, who are working on this, you know, in your financial institution, um, know that we really do read uh, your SARS and, and they're really appreciated. 
So let's talk a little bit more about that collaboration standpoint. I think we heard that yesterday too, like the, the value in, in fraud and the value in these communities is to be able to kind of like build a network and build consortiums, whether that's people coming together or technologies and tools to understand like the bigger picture. Um, I think last year you guys prosecuted the, um, the uh, pandemic unemployment fraud. Uh, just for the record, we had several of our employees in our Seattle office that uh, actually were, were uh, part of that. Their information was used, so it was really interesting. But what ways, um, Naftali, maybe I'll start with you, um, are, you know, uh, fintech companies um, thinking about how we partner and collaborate and be better partners for, you know, with our, with our public sector? Yeah, I think probably the, the best example I can show of this um, is, you know, we talked about um, liveness checks and, um, you know, how AI might be able to defeat them uh, better in the future. Um, interestingly, those are actually not the best treatment strategy for synthetic fraud uh, by far. The best treatment strategy is the result of a public-private partnership with the Social Security Administration called ECBSV, um, which is a mouthful, but it stands for Electronic Consent-Based SSN Verification. Um, and it's a partnership, yeah, I got that, right? <laughs> I had to study my briefing notes beforehand. Uh, no, but um, seriously, um, it allows you to check if the SSA has issued a name, date of birth, and SSN um, to an individual. Um, it requires consent. There's a lot of um, uh, sort of requirements of the program, but that's actually the, the best way to figure out if a suspected synthetic identity actually is uh, synthetic. Um, and I think that's a really great example of a public-private partnership where the industry, in working with the Social Security Administration, um, is actually able to get um, really the best possible treatment strategy you could have to confirm that someone's a synthetic identity, or on the converse, for uh, young people or immigrants or people who are new to credit that don't have any kind of you know, history, um, to prove that there actually are real people and they're not synthetic identities and that they should be able to enter the financial services ecosystem. Yeah. Um, Alana, what would you say for those of us in this room that don't have the luxury of living here in New York with your office and your dedication? Um, so besides your beautiful stars, keep writing those, what can we do in other parts of the world or the states to kind of work with um, our, our um, local folks to do more there. Absolutely. So a uh, huge part of my investigative process is sending out subpoenas and reviewing compliance. And a lot of times when we're uh, drafting our subpoenas, we don't know what we don't know. So we don't know what all the different kinds of data are that the company may collect. We don't know what their internal names are for documents. You know, we may not know how to, you know, request certain things. So we... Uh, you know, to try to cover our bases, make the subpoenas very broad and far-reaching and, and use terms like, like anything and everything, like any financial document. And I often wish that I could get someone from the compliance department on the phone to just talk to me and say, hey, here is the universe of documents um, that we actually have so I can tailor my subpoenas, make them more specific. I had one instance where I went back and forth with a company because I couldn't get a, a certain set of statements. And then at the end, they were like, oh, because you didn't call it like the, the automated monthly like statement report. And I was like, I, how would I know I, that? I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was like I said, any and all kind of statements. But I didn't use that term. So uh, typically what I do when I'm subpoenaing a company that I'm not that familiar with or is new to me, I always check out their, their terms, their privacy policy. I look for what information they're disclosing to the customer that they're collecting about them online, and I use that to kind of tailor my subpoenas. But I love it even more when there's some type of law enforcement landing page that reviews uh, what is available and the terms and the methods that um, they would prefer us to use. And I love it even more when there's actually a, a dedicated phone number for compliance or law enforcement so I can try to talk to someone first and, and shape and craft the subpoena and, and make it you know, better for, for both of us. Yeah. Sarah, on the collaboration kind of uh, networking front, um, would love to hear about, obviously, Alloy is a platform, bringing a lot of that together. Um, you know, what things do you think we could be doing better? 
Yeah, absolutely. So Beth, as you said, Alloy is a global identity decisioning platform. So we take over 180 data sources, vendors, and pull them. We have pre-built integration. So you can send in your application, choose who you want to, who you deem to be best in class, and use them for originations, transaction monitoring. I think what becomes really important about that, the collaboration to even bring all of those vendors together. Maybe it's already in your existing tech stack, and you still want to be able to use them, but not in a siloed integration. You want to use them under, under one hood, so to speak. But it's the collaboration that and recognition that you need multiple vendors to really fight the good fight. Um, that there are different vendors that do different things and you know really have their specialties. And so, you know, making sure that you're layering in that detection um, and working with your fraud solution providers. And I think a really big piece too is the education. So a lot of times, if you're in the fraud space, you live and breathe this every day. Uh, but there are still, even though it's in the media, there are still a lot of folks that don't completely understand um, synthetic or identity fraud, or maybe they're not checking, you know, keeping their PII secure, et cetera. So I think it's the collaboration, as everyone even in this room to some extent, to fight that fight. And then collaborating with your fraud solution providers, your technology teams, to ensure that you're really future-proofing your your um, your system. Yeah, Steve, anything to add? Yeah, uh, so kind of three things. I'll try to make them fast and short. If you so, if you don't have an excellent prosecutor in New York, and your case you is do not have Alana. Yeah, yeah, and you're in, somewhere else, right in the United States. One of the biggest problems we had early with synthetics is you have to educate the prosecutors and law enforcement what it is. It's not taught in the academies, right? Financial crime is not part of what they used to do. Now they do a lot of it, right? So you really had to educate law enforcement. And that means literally going to your AUSA's office, going to your local uh, FBI Secret Service, going to local law enforcement, right, to understand. Because when you have to file a case, you don't want to have to explain to them what the case is when it's happening. You want to have them already understand what's going on. Second, as far as collaborations, uh, you want to really think about sharing the information that's out there, right? And, and this information is kind of touchy because it's not, it's not really a true victim, right? And so there's a lot of privacy laws out there um, to share you know, data that doesn't really belong to anybody. Privacy attorneys still have issues with that. And so there really is no consortium out there that shares true synthetic data across the entire enterprise. Now, there is an informal solution and the shameless plug here that will happen. Um, there is a working group that I co-chair that has over 650 organizations, law enforcement, big banks, small banks, insurance, e-commerce, et cetera, right? We share intel all day, every day. Uh, each month, about 16,000 pieces of intel go through our network, um, which basically alert everybody as to, hey, heads up, this person's coming, right? Or this person just busted out, or this person's synthetic. Um, so it, it's, if you're interested in that, reach out to me on LinkedIn or find me afterwards. I'd be happy, happy to share that with everybody. Um, I know we're up on time. I don't have PJ or any of them jumping and waving at me, so clearly it's not too bad. Not but you can see them anyway. <laughs> not that, yeah, not that we could see. Um, but I, the QR code right here, if anybody scan that, if we have um, questions, we can take that. If we don't have any, do we have any questions? Go ahead. Sorry, I, can, I can't see you, but go ahead. I can see your hand. I see your hand. Um, so the legality of sharing synthetic PII, since it's not uh, valid, um, has, any, has the DA made a ruling or any, any government agency given a ruling on this so that we could share a little more broadly or at speed? I mean, to, to receive any info Oops, sorry. To receive any information from a financial institution, whether or not it's, it's valid on the back end, we, we, we wouldn't do so without a subpoena or, or unless it was in a, a backup document as part of a SAR filing. And then someone, I think, in the back had another question. Thank you. We're, we're breaking the QR code <laughs> rule. PJ, don't be upset. So uh, let's say seven, eight years ago, uh, synthetic ID fraud was a major growing problem. So absolutely not. It's shifted from traditional credit card and big banks to smaller credit unions and mid-sized regional banks that are unprotected and don't understand synthetics. And it's moved into healthcare, insurance, right. auto, buy now, pay later. 
fintech, crypto, right? So it's just shifted where it's where it's easier, right? And it, it, it's causing rampant problems now. Yeah, Naftali. Yeah, I would actually say that um, some of those same fraudsters have shifted to doing um, other things. And, and actually, one thing that I'll just have a little plug on here is um, I think our industry, uh, like fraud prevention in general, um, is frankly just like shamelessly irresponsible with estimates of fraud, honestly. Like the $6 billion number for how much synthetic fraud there is has been thrown around a lot. I've heard $20 billion. Um, both of those numbers are, are wildly inflated. It's uh, probably in the mid to high hundreds of millions a year. Um, but no, it, it, it's true. I mean, fraud does shift. I think the, like, I think many, I'm not going to name any names or regions, but I think a lot of us know where the fraud comes from. And, you know, in those regions, you actually see a lot of those people are shifting to doing other kinds of fraud. Um, I think most notably um, different types of first party fraud, where many of the people that were committing um, synthetic identity fraud are now doing things like credit washing. So they're falsely claiming to be the victims of ID theft in order to remove derogatory stuff off their credit reports. It's truly despicable uh, in the, you know, they're, they're abusing the rights that uh, real victims of fraud have um, in order to enrich themselves. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of that fraud actually has shifted to, um, to other kinds of things. Obviously during the pandemic, everyone was just minting money with uh, unemployment insurance fraud and things like that. But no, the, the fraud really does shift. Great. Um, the questions are up, which is awesome. So Alana, there's a couple for you about like um, how large, right, um, or Gregarious does a fraud case have to be to uh, prosecute it. And then there was another question, so I'll have you answer both that I saw on the phone that was like, um, if, you know, we don't have um, SARS or backup documents, like, how do we find out more information? Can we call you? I think you're going to be handing out your personal number here after this. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just address the first uh, question about how large or egregious does it need to be. Um, so just to clarify, I, I'm a state and local prosecutor, and there also are in New York uh, federal uh, prosecutors. And the federal uh, prosecuting offices tend to have a, a higher threshold for dollar amount, um, usually at least like over a million or so. Um, and. And the local DA's offices are, are happy to, to handle uh, smaller amounts. Um, but there, there's one thing to, to keep in mind. If you've spotted like a, you know, a synthetic ID that has contributed to a $5,000 loss, I probably wouldn't at that time go running to the DA's office because if there's one instance of that, there's probably at least 25 other linked instances. So that's why that's what I meant about having an investigator who's kind of willing to invest and build up the case before they bring it to the office, making such a big difference. Because if you can, on the back end, looking at you know device identifiers or advertising ID or cookies or whatever other tracking mechanism realize that that $5,000 fraud is tied into something else right. and pretty quickly you have $200,000 yeah. yeah. and that's the best time to, to pitch the case to, uh, to your local prosecutor's office. Great. And how do folks get in touch with you? That was the other question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, ManhattanDA.org, the, the website, there's a, a landing platform for the cybercrime and identity theft page with our, with our hotline number on that. I, again, I'm a local prosecutor, so right. I am right. limited by jurisdiction, but I, I know other people who, who work in the field, so I'm happy to try to connect people to the right places. Alana's going to get like 80 LinkedIn <laughs> requests after she leaves this room. <laughs> but oh, sorry, I just Go wanted ahead. to follow up on something that Steve said about education, and that's so important because I've had, um, if I'm interacting with someone at a financial institution and, you know, and I can see that they're really smart and motivated at that point, whether they like it or not, they're um, in my orbit for the rest of their career. <laughs> and I, I... So she's saying request <laughs> carefully. So, so I have frequently invited people from financial institutions to come in and do presentations for my ADAs and analysts to just show them this is what onboard, onboarding for a customer looks like, this is how you would uh, read our statements, Th these are the things that you can request, and just that direct, direct you know, contact really pays off in the future. Awesome. Um, Steve, there's definitely a, qu a couple questions for you, and these, these are brilliant questions. Like, what have you learned 
with your three fakies um, that identified gaps or things that you know folks in, in, in this um, conference could be thinking about addressing? Yeah, so when I first developed these, I learned it was really, really easy uh, to do. Um, you know, it's gotten a little more difficult, right? You know, creating a Facebook profile was easy to do 10 years ago. Now they actually try to verify you. It's still easy to get by but it, at least they're trying, right? And so there are some hurdles that are there. Um, you know, pandemic and has really shifted us digitally, right? And, and FinTech has been, is it really a new path for us now. In the, in the early 2000s, we knew there were particular, you know, credit cards that were, I call it starter drugs, right? I could go to this particular issuer, they give me a card, 500 bucks, and I was off and running. Now I just have to play that through a FinTech, through a, a you know, a small DDA account they've set up. I'll use a buy and I'll pay later. I will leverage my way through. So even though it's gotten a little more frictionless, uh, friction, I still have ways to get in. And that's, I think, what's happened now is that there's so many more ways to get into the system. And once I get in, in, in with the data aggregators, then it, it explodes, right? It pollinates, it, just, it exponentially gets bigger, and it makes my life easier. I just need one door to open, and then I'm off to the races. So, Naftali, you want to address that a little bit, obviously, as the, the tech founder? Like, what, what should we be doing to help pl <laughs> plug holes, gaps, gateways that... Uh Stephen has. Well, there was already one shameless plug on stage, so I won't put another one in. But, um, <laughs> Ouch, shots fired, Steve. <laughs> but uh, no, in all seriousness, um, the things to do to identify um, synthetic product, it's actually really not rocket science. It's really stuff associated with figuring out, does this identity make cohesive sense? You know, one of the uh, probably simplest checks you can do, this is not going to catch all your synthetic fraud, but it's a, or even you shouldn't use this as a rule, but it's a starting point, um, is look at the identity and, and look, hey, does this social security number make sense for that person? You know, if um, uh, you have a 44 year old uh, male, um, and, um, you know, that would, man, I have to do more math on stage. You're already mapped out ECBSV. You know, and so that person is born in what, 1979. Um, that person should have an SSN um, that was probably issued for them maybe, uh, man, 10-ish uh, years later or something like that, depending on, um, if, since SSN used to be issued around when you turned 18, now it's more issued around birth, um, but something that actually makes sense. If instead you see an SSN that was uh, randomly issued, so post-2011, or maybe an SSN that was issued in 2009, you should look at it and say, look, that really doesn't really make sense uh, for that identity. Um, there's other things as well. You know, you should expect address history to be relatively cohesive. You should expect, um, uh, you know, more history for someone that you know should have uh, should have more history. Uh, you should expect their age of email address to match um, the rest of their history. Stuff like that. Um, so it's really not, um, you know, rocket science. There. You know, I mentioned ECBSV, which is the best treatment strategy for synthetic fraud. If you suspect um, an identity of being synthetic, um, the best practices today are to uh, ask for uh, ECBSV and, and go ask the SSA, did you actually issue the social to this person? And a yes there obviously is quite strong. Um, so I don't think we, you know, yet need to do any, you know, pull the generative AI uh, lever or anything like that. It's it's not um, it's not too hard. But uh, shameless plug once again. Yeah, Sarah, do you have anything to add? Obviously, you were talking about the the layers of data and the different types of things, and maybe that to Naftali's point, it's like, how, what are you using for identity verification or matching or, um, you know, history? Um, any additional, like, commentary there? I, so, I mean, I just would say that I completely agree with all of those points, and it really comes down to, again, the, the layering, as Naftali's saying, just take a step back, and sometimes you even do need to ask, does this make sense? So if you're reviewing something in a manual review queue, is this person just looking from a KYC compliance perspective, or are they looking, you know, with their fraud hat on? Um, and really ask yourself, does this make sense? But I do think that there's rules that can be put into place Strategically, um, if you're not in a place that you are ready to invest in a model and, and something else, that you can start to pull some things together just with the data on the application. Great. Um, and we've probably got time for the last two questions, so I'm going to ask them. Um, deep fake, you brought it up. Selfies, someone wants to know, should we be doing more? We should be doing more, but it's way too early, right? The talk yesterday again. We're in the, the AOL stage of deep fake and, and that stuff. So yeah. it just, it's just—it's going to be on—it's on the horizon, right? You know, um, 
it, it's getting much easier, right? It, it, like at its barest thing, think of it this way: you can do almost a deep fake on, when you're on your Facebook, right? You put yourself rabbit ears and fake, fake noses, right? That's the very, very basic. It's not a deep fake, but that's kind of where it's get, it's going to get that easy in the next probably two to three years, right? And so that's that's what scares us. So I wouldn't worry about it now. It's another, as Natalia mentioned, it's a problem down the road. Right now, we're not we're not just taking care of the basic common sense things. That's that's the scary part, right? If you look at it and go, you know, this doesn't make sense. The hardest part is getting that that identity in front of someone to ask that question, right? Does it make sense? You know, find the needle in the haystack because the haystacks right now are really big. There, there are roughly six million identities that overlap in the United States. Not because of fraud, just because of data entry errors, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a problem. Like, how do, you, how do you handle that data duplication? Right. Um, this question is anonymous. If it were not, I would, I would give you a gift card because I was waiting for this question, which is how do you balance friction with, <laughs> she's like, that's me, I owe you. Um, how do you balance friction with uh, the consumer experience? Great question, thank you. Uh, I can answer that one. Um, for synthetic fraud in particular, uh, you actually don't need uh, very much friction at all. Um, 95, 98% of identities are obviously not synthetic. Someone born in 1979, SSN issued in 1990, history starting in 2000. It's not synthetic. You can use a score like Centrelink or others to say, hey, this is obviously not. And then for the things that are synthetic, I mentioned ECVSV is the best treatment strategy. Um, The friction for ECVSV um, is uh, a lot less compared to things like a liveness check or asking for documents or something like that. You click a box in an online application flow and you have consent, you can go to the SSA. Um, and so for some, there's, there's other forms of fraud. Identity theft uh, is one where you might need additional friction. Um, but for synthetic fraud in particular, uh, even uh, customers that go through the elevated flow and, and you do need to ask ECBSV from uh, probably won't even notice it. Uh, the only friction they'll see is you push a box in the application flow. Let's ask you, because you do this all the time. How much friction do you find when you're trying to fake the system, Steve? Uh, so the, there's a great quote I came across from uh, another fraud fighter that said, a, a good customer will exit a bad experience, right? A bad customer experience. A bad customer, i.e. a fraudster, will go through a bad experience, right? Because they're ultimately trying to get you know, the, the, uh, the, the crown jewels there. So um, yes, yeah, as Nathalie mentioned again there, right? Um, synthetics, we, we would persistent to a point, And to be honest, sometimes we want we want to get declined because when we get declined, we're starting to, again, send data to the aggregator, especially if we're applying for credit. We're sending those inquiries to the bureaus and it starts to make us look like more people, et cetera. So friction needs to be applied, but the reality is, is you, know, you can still open the account for them. I wouldn't recommend it, but if you do, you still have tools behind the scenes to kind of mitigate that, right? But if you're doing a lending product, like you're going to give a $50,000 loan, then you're in trouble there. So you want to apply as much friction as possible there, because once that money gets out the door, it's gone. Right, it's gone. So risk-based friction, depending on the the, the risk. Um, one question: it, It's gone now, but I'm curious. Have you guys seen any patterns of like specifically the 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 weak link in the synthetic identity? Is it usually around social security? Is it around? You know, we've often seen like it's around how they're going to actually get the money. So usually an email or an address or like have you? Is there any patterns that you guys have seen of like these attributes tend to be the one that the yeah, one that I would point out that I think enables a lot of synthetic fraud as well as a lot of other types of uh, first party fraud is uh, piggybacking. So um, if you make a fake person, that's great, but you can't really do very much with them. The, all you can get is maybe a low limit credit card. Um, but if you add that person as an authorized user on some high limit old credit cards, all of a sudden your synthetic identity has a 750 credit score and looks really good. It can go you know, get a lot of different uh, kinds of credit. like. You, know, you don't need to buy pizza for them every month for years in order to make it happen. You can create a fake person, sign them up for a couple of auth user cards, and go from there. And uh, today, there are a number of online sites that allow you to purchase authorized user cards or pa- purchase authorized user status to improve your credit. Well, fraudsters use that themselves for their synthetic identities. Um, and I'd point that out as one of the weak links in the system that allows synthetic identities to go from this is a fake person, but you can't do anything with them, to this is a fake person and they've got really good credit, better credit than you know, many of us in this room, um, and uh, you know, allow you to actually bust out more quickly. 
Um, we're running up on time, so I'm gonna do the the typical panel end here, which is everybody usually remembers the first thing you said or the last thing you said. So, um, what is kind of you know your your word or words of wisdom um, on the topic and and how, what folks should be taken away from here? Sarah, we'll start with you. Work our way down. Yeah, and, and I think I mentioned it earlier, it, it's the be proactive, so take a look now and the investments that you are going to make, can they help you to scale and grow from a, for your good clients, but then do they allow you the flexibility that you have the ability to, to shift and move and be really agile in the future as you need? I mean, as Steve said, it's one thing deep fakes now, but that's something, you know, a few years from now, right, that we're going to be in a different place. So as you make an investment, is it a solution that can help you 10 years from now, or is it one that you're going to be back to a rip and replace? So I think being really proactive and, and layering your technology and your fraud solutions. Uh, the one last slide I'd leave all everyone with here is um, the best way to stop this kind of fraud is to understand it. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt about synthetic identity fraud and Frankenstein and you know, generative AI and a whole bunch of stuff like that. But actually, at least today, um, you can really wrap your arms around it by reviewing cases and understanding what it really looks like. Um, at Centrelink, deep understanding is one of our corporate values. Every week, I have the entire company, from me, the CEO, to our engineers, our fraud intelligence analysts, our accountants. Every single person spends an hour reviewing fraud cases. And that experience of doing that is so incredibly valuable for us in developing that deep understanding. And um, I think any of you who go through that same sort of experience by looking at real cases and understanding what the fraudster did or understanding you know, what a young person did to prove who they were, I think will develop you that same deep understanding that will allow you to put the best sort of solutions in place. I love that. Be curious, right? Continue to be curious. That's awesome. Steve? So I'll give you two takeaways. One is the Federal Reserve of Boston. Hey, I said one. OK, well, it's fast. <laughs> Let me get real fast. Sorry. I didn't like third earlier. So. Federal Reserve of Boston clearly defines synthetic identity. It should be the industry standard. Uh, so go to Federal Reserve of Boston site. There's a great toolbox that's there avail available, videos, infographics, et cetera. So a great spot to go because we have to define synthetic identity as one, uh, uh, one definition, right? Second is don't blindly trust your data. That's how people like me get into your portfolios because you trust the data. Great. Alana? Uh, yes, this is a little bit similar to Steve's second takeaway. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, we're at a fintech conference, and obviously there's a lot of technology um, at our disposal, but uh, my best cases have started with a, a call from an investigator who has said, you know, I got a, I got a funny feeling about this one. <laughs> and um, I love when, when people trust their gut, so definitely uh, don't lose sight of that, even as you incorporate, you know, more and more technology into your practice. Awesome. Thank you. It was a privilege. I learned a lot. Um, appreciate you guys being here and your time. Um, hopefully you guys did too. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.